Blessings, blessings. Much love to everyone. Thanks for tuning in once again. Yeah. I just want to tell you right away, you got to come with a clean spirit and a good heart for this one. No hijacks allowed. This video and the next couple of videos were a long time coming. So shout out to all who have come before me to teach this hidden uh, misunderstood history, genealogy, and scripture. Uh, brothers like 42 The Drop Radio, uh, you know, Con Drop. Uh, shout out to my bro, A New Breed, as well for the help with the studies on this, and many, many more. Let's study and research together. It may start out slow, but give us some time. You guys are going to see how important this video is. And this is going to lead to many other presentations. This is very important to the nations this pertains to and to all the nations of the world because the children are waking up and this can't be left unnoticed anymore. So let's get right into it. I hope you guys enjoy. But right away, I want to start with a Bible verse. Yeah, and if you're not into anybody reading from the Bible, or if you think we're talking about religion and you're saying, well, this ain't for me. Why is he reading from this? Then definitely the same for you. Go watch another video. We're about to get historic. We're about to get really deep. And we already know that even though it has become religion, the Old Testament's history. And we pull out the babies out of everything, especially when it comes to scripture. There was one promise and prophecy made uh, for the line of Judah. It's in Genesis 49, 10, 11. I'm going to read it real quick. It says here, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, until the Most High come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. All right, the gathering of the people, the lost people. So basically this is saying that the right to rule, the royal lineage will always be with Judah. The throne will always have a descendant of Judah, even up till today, guys, even right now, even if they might be half or mixed or bastard kids. You guys are going to see they have Jacob's pillow, the stone of destiny in their throne today. They've been using it in their coronations since day one. So keep that in mind. Most High said Judah's lineage will always have somebody in the throne. Now, another verse I want to read to you guys before we begin the video real quick is a couple of verses here from Jeremiah 39. This is regarding Sedekiah and what happened to him when Nebuchadnezzar came, invaded, and took over the kingdom of Judah. He was the last king of Judah from the same line as King David. 
So it says here, in the ninth year of Sedekiah, king of Judah, in the tenth month came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army against Jerusalem, and they besieged it. And in the eleventh year of Sedekiah, in the fourth month, the ninth day of the month, the city was broken into. And all the princes of the king of Babylon came in and sat in the middle gate, even Nergal Shereser, Samgar Nebo, Sarsishim, Rapsadis, Nergal Shereser, Rabmat, with all the residue of the princes of the king of Babylon. So they took over the city right now, they're in the middle gate. And it came to pass that when Sedekiah, the king of Judah, saw them and all the men of war, then they fled and went forth out of the city by night by the way of the king's garden, by the gate between the two walls. And he went out the way of the plain. So Sedekiah and his royal family and the nobles, what did they do? They ran away. They tried to escape when they were getting invaded by Nebuchadnezzar. But listen to what happened. But the Chaldeans, again, who? The Chaldeans. Who's the Chaldeans? Remember Ireland of Chaldea? Yeah. The famous works of Flavius Josephus, right? The antiquities of the Jews, right? So this is written by himself, it says here, translated from the original Greek by William Winston, AM, professor of mathematics in the University of Cambridge. What did Josephus have to say about the Chaldeans, right? On page 48 of this uh, book, it says here, Shem, the third son of Noah, had five sons who inhabited the land that begat, began at the Euphrates and reached to the Indian Ocean. For Elam left behind him the Elamites and the ancestors of the Persians. Whoa, did you know that? All right, I've mentioned this before. Part two of my Nations of the World video. All right, Elam is the progenitor of the Elamites, who are actually the ancestors of the Persians. Yeah, the historic Persians are actually descendants of Shem. Yes. So real quick, I just want to show you, when you actually look this up, like, you know, just generally off the top, they're going to tell you, you know, old Persian was an ancient civilization centered in the far west and southwest of modern day Iran, stretching from the lowlands of what is now Kusinstan. All right, blah, 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 blah. They won't ever tell you that they descend from Shem or Elam, an actual person. Elam, it consisted of kingdoms. Elam is, they just see it as a kingdom, but Elam was a person. Elam, all right, so that's the hijack. This is what they never told you, all right? Again, let's go back to Josephus, all right? Elam, that's one of Shem's son, the ancestor of the Persians, Ashur, all right? Ashur lived at the city of Nineveh and named his subjects Assyrians. Yes, the Assyrians are from Ashur, Ashur, all right? Assyrians, Ashur. Again, Ashur was the second son of Shem. The son of Noah, Ashur's brothers were Elam, Arphaxad, Lud, and Aram. Again, the Assyrians come out of Ashur, who's the son of Shem. The Assyrians and Persians, again, so far, Shem, all right? Persians and Assyrians, who became the most fortunate nation beyond others. Arphaxad, Ur, Ar, now pay attention, Ar, Ur, Ur, Farsad, or Kassan, Ur, Farsad, named the Arphaxadites who are now called Chaldeans, who are the what? The Chaldeans, they're now called Chaldeans, who are for Shaddites, the Arthur Shaddites, or the, the descendants of Arthur Shad. They're Chaldeans, right? Who was the Chaldeans again? That's where Abraham and Tehran, his dad, were living in Chaldea, right? Or Ur, Uri, Uria, the land of Uria, or Urialand, Urland, right? That was actually descendants of Arthur Farshadites or Arfashad, again, all from Shem. Aram had the Aramites, even the Aramites, which the Greeks call Syrians. I, the Syrians or Aramites are from Aram, which is from Shem. All right. As Laud founded the Laudites, I, the Laudites, which are now called Lydians. The Lydians are also from Shem. Now, remember also, we just had the videos about the Mayas, right? The ancient Mayas going and becoming the chaldeans all right we just got that on the queen mu book again these are all semitic people but the chaldeans right army pursued after them and overtook sedekiah in the plains of jericho and when they had taken him they brought him up to nebuchadnezzar king of babylon 
to Riblah in the land of Hamath, where he gave judgment upon him. So they captured Zedekiah, right, the king of Judah. Then the king of Babylon slew the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes in Riblah. What happened? So when they captured Zedekiah, they actually killed his heirs, his sons. No more line of Judah, at least not from Zedekiah. No more male heirs. It continues saying, also, the king of Babylon slew all the nobles of Judah and even all the nobles to make sure they wouldn't have heirs. Or that continue. So Nebuchadnezzar literally ended the male line of Zedekiah that was coming from the same line of David. This is the kings of Judah. So literally, no more Judah male heirs. They didn't say anything about the females though. All right? Keep that in mind. Moreover, he put out Zedekiah's eyes and bound him with chains to carry him to Babylon. And the Chaldeans burned the king's house and the house of the people with fire and broke down the walls of Jerusalem. So that was the last king of Judah through the line of David. Now this doesn't make sense, right? Because Most High told us that Judah will always have somebody in the throne. It's supposed to be a male, right? But in this case, when it comes to the same line David comes out of, we're going to see what progenitor that really was. We're going to go back. There's no more descendants on that side. There's no more male heirs. So how did the throne continue? This is something we're going to talk about in this video and many more to come. This is a whole other history that they never really teach us about. But many people, many you guys are going to see, wrote books about it, did the research, knew the genealogy of these ancient Irish kings, Scottish, English kings, the kings of Troy, and many of the so-called Greek nations. As we saw in my Danite videos, the Danites were being called many things. Phoenicians, they were called Greeks, many other things. Vikings, Danes, Twatidanan, you guys already know. So part of the video, so part of the presentation today, we'll be talking about the survivors, the princesses, the females, and the role Jeremiah played with them, and also another line of Judah. Yes, a line that didn't inherit the throne because it was the second son born. But eventually you guys are going to see the role they played as well. So keep these two verses in mind so you can understand what happened before the exodus out of Egypt and during the exodus. After We will read from the book, England, the remnant of Judah and the Israel of Ephraim. The two families under one head, a Hebrew episode in British history by the Reverend F.R.A. Glover, M.A., late chaplain to the consulate at Cologne. This is from 1881. Part 1. The Signs of Judah. Chapter 1. In the system of polity of England, there are three prominent and very important matters. A material fact and hereditary descent, and heraldic blazon. If these things exist, there is no denying them. They do exist. There is a cause for their existence. These things are all Eastern. The first is Jacob's stone. The second, the descent of the monarch enthroned on it, assumed. The third, the standard of the lion rampant, manifest. If these things came from the East, they must have been brought. Who brought them? They are all Hebraicish. The first, manifestly, as its name implies. The second, provably so. The third is the standard of the tribe of Judah. The bringer of them must, therefore, have been a Hebrew and undoubtedly one of note and power. Viewed collectively, these things have great significance and may have or exercise an important influence on present and future events, the which indeed must be the case. If the character, the power, and the mission of the bringer of these things from Judea be taken into account from Judea, where's the true Judea, promised land, America? For it will be seen by a variety of circumstantial evidence that this bringer was no less a person and no other than the illustrious prophet Jeremiah, okay? Yes, Jeremiah from the Bible, Old Testament. 
Remember, Jeremiah was the one who was there and prophesied to King Sedekiah when he got taken over by Nebuchadnezzar and his sons got killed and all the males of Judah. Only the females survived. Yes, we're going to see Jeremiah had a big role in preserving the line of Judah in Europe. The man destined by God in his early days to foretell and to aid in the outrooting of the polity and kingdom of Judah, as he was equally in his latter days to help, to plan and to build the same elsewhere. And this can be proved not because of a certain tradition affirms that the prophet was in Ireland as the instructor of one of its greatest kings, but because the three premises admitted nobody but Jeremiah could have conveyed them thither or bring in them have established the stone so as to accord with the terms of the tradition concerning it. The legend of the stone and the tradition is that wherever that stone might be, a scepter should be with it until it returned to the east whence it came. A tradition confirmed as to the eastern origin of the stone by the discovery now. So real quick, when they mean east, they mean coming from the promised land what they're calling the so-called East. But remember, if you go the farthest, farthest East, you end up in America, all right? Just follow Marco Polo. So a tradition confirmed as to the Eastern origin of the stone by the discovery now that its name failed, which was thought to be Irish, is Irish only in as much as it is adopted from the Hebrew and as to its prophetic aspect and not contradicted hitherto by subsequent events connected with it although traversing a strange and checkered course for upward of 2,400 years, for the stone has still a scepter belonging to it, even that of the mightiest nation on the earth, a nation of nations, truly even so a nation of nations. And the ruler who is enthroned thereon can claim to descend from the kings of the race then and there set upon it. And who shall say that it is not to go back to that east whence it came in honor and power even as it emerged from it, out of a disaster and woe, that those that sowed in tears shall not have a joyful harvest? This tradition, however, it is to be especially noted, though a prophecy and a promise requiring the presence of some certain one to make it of possible performance, is without any allusion to the most important facts of the case. The identity of the individuals in whom the transaction of the setting up of this stone in Ireland originated, with two celebrated persons, intimately and officially connected with Hebrew history and the Hebrew polity. One, a prophet and priest, right? A prophet and a priest. The other, a woman, a princess, all right? We're just talking about the princesses of Judah. A state of things which is only now, at this moment, 1861, being first openly exhibited to man, and which the proof being based upon material and historical data, now first drawn from the obscurity of a language which concealed them and placed them in juxta position he man is called upon finding out and searching into the reason of things being as they were and are to consider with relation to their practical bearing on present and future events why since they establish as an historical fact that england is the remnant of judah for if this case can be proved then does this strange reality stand out upon the canvas of modern history? Namely, that England is the possessor of the throne of David and its representative and the continuator of the scepter of Judah, of which the patriarch Jacob foretold continuance until the coming of Shiloh. And that, coupled with all this, the standard of Judah is not only the ensign, which this power will have sooner or later to unfurl as the ensign to the nation and to which the dispersed of Judah will have to rally. But that her own Scottish blazon is, as that standard of Judah, the mark, outward and visible, by which connection is established between the dislodged royalty of Jerusalem and the rehabilitated Judah of the West. And that she, England, is therefore under this triple manifestation of Hebraical identity the true and provable and legal representative and entity of the remnant of Judah. That remnant, including king's daughters, which was warned to escape from Egypt in company with the prophet Jeremiah and promised protection if it did, okay? From Egypt, ancient to Mary, America. That remnant making Judea its way to sanctuary. 
became under the conduct of the prophet, whose duty it was to provide for such a restoration of the royal house, wherever he might in the providence of God be directed to go, and that he went to Ireland, we are able to prove. All right, we got a little bit of this in my day and night videos, remember? Okay, with the Trois de Danan, he was held by the Trois de Danan, they made a marriage, okay, with somebody. We're gonna go over all this again. So they went to Ireland, right? Jeremiah and the king's daughters, the legal representative of the house of David of the polity of Judah and of the interim state of entire Israel. This, however, will seem to many a relation so strange as that no man should be called upon to give it credence without proof, all right? They're going to be like, Kurimel, you're just talking about Bible stories. you just, this is pseudo Kurimel. You're making things up. All right, well, we'll see the history of what people have written down and said already. When we're talking about people from these times. The first point to establish will be the office of the prophet Jeremiah in the matter. He being the substratum or foundation upon which the whole edifice is made to rest. So then it goes on to chapter 2. It says here, Jeremiah the prophet to the nations. Now, before we actually continue in this book, we're going to come back to this. Now that we are opened up the topic, right? We're talking about descendants of Israelites. We're talking about Judah, you know, royal Israelites. We're talking about the prophet Jeremiah. Yes, a real person that ended up in Ireland. We got a little bit of this in my Danai video. We're going to go ahead and get deep today. We're going to read many books and try to put it all together little by little. We're just going to read what these people said and a history that they never told us about and we're going to make our own conclusions with it all right so before i continue just want to remind everybody the journey we've taken a lot of the research we've done before these are some of the videos i would like you guys if you haven't watched it you know to help understand what we're going to be uh, reading today and in the next several videos what we have here, if you see in the top, it says Phoenician Kurimel. If you put that in and hit search, you get these uh, videos. These are some of the videos that uh, you guys should definitely check out. Uh, as we see here, part 11 of Nations of the World, part 13, Nations of the World, part 14, right? So we got Hittite, Phoenician, Aryans, Kati, Kati Barat, or Origin of the Britons, Barat, Brit, right? And then uh, 13 gods of the Phoenicians, also the kings of Atlantis. So what we're trying to show is that, you know, a lot of these gods from the Greeks and Romans actually were passed down by so-called Phoenicians who took it from so-called Atlanteans, right? So that's what we're showing. Phoenicians are coming out of Canaan, which is the true promised land, America. Basically, as it says here, Phoenicians from Atlantis, right? Phoenicians from Atlantis. We also got part 12 of Nations of the World, really good one with Abraham and the Chaldeans. All right, we're going to get to that. All right, as you guys see, Ireland, my Ireland videos, and my Danite videos. As you guys can see, if you put Danite and hit Kurimel, Danite, Kurimel together, you get my Danite videos, which is also very important for uh, understanding what we're going to read today, because it's basically going to talk about the Danites again. They're heavily involved with the royalty of Judah and helping that line continue. Danites receive fair and people. We got part 15 of Nations of the World. And we also got two other separate videos like this one. Uh, feathered Crown Danites. Yeah, Feathered Crown Danites became the Egyptian Dayan. They uh, were known to wear feathered crowns. And they're also the Greek Danans. We've gone over this. The Danai and the Hindu Danavas. The Nuna. These are all the Danites. Yes. And then we got this other one right here. As you guys can see, the Tuata de Danan. Danes, Danaus, Cadmus, Stone of Jacob, Queen Tefi. All right, we're going to get into Queen Tefi today. We just read how Jeremiah had a big part in uh, preserving the royal line of Judah. And that was through the daughters of Judah who were spared. Queen Tefi is one of them. The legendary Queen Tefi of Ireland is a daughter of Judah. She was with Jeremiah. It says here, Exodus out of Egypt. So that's a great video right there. Make sure you guys check all these videos out. We might go over some of the information on uh, we've gone over in these videos, but uh, make sure to check those out. 
So if you put Ireland, Curimeo, Chaldees, you get my Ireland or of the Chaldees series, also great. And it helps you understand because we're dealing with Ireland and the British Isles. Uh, <laughs> who was the descendants of Arfishat? It's not just through Selah, but he had other sons. And those descendants eventually became known as the Chaldeans. That's why Abraham's uh, people are living in Chaldea, which is ancient Ireland or, you know, the British Isles right there. So you got all three parts right here ready for you to watch. And then you got Chaldeans of Arfishat or Kazdim or Kaset Shem, Abraham's genealogy. So make sure to check out all these videos. Of course, I got a lot more. But you guys will see how it all connects with uh, what we're going to read today. All right, so I hope you guys don't mind. We're going to do a lot of reading today. We got another book here we're going to get into. This book is called Anglo-Israel, or the Saxon Race, proved to be the lost tribes of Israel, in nine lectures by the Reverend W. H. Poole, LLD. All right, we're going to probably belly flop to the uh, second lecture, right, um, uh, as I was skimming through uh, this book, uh, I noticed this part right here where it says Tarshish. Uh, very interesting. He actually quotes a lot of Bible uh, passages and other histories when dealing with the Phoenician traders, as we see here. The Isle of Tarshish, or Tarshish is an island or Isle. There was a lot of trade going on with Tarshish, and they were going to get precious metals there uh, in biblical history and also in ancient uh, history and other writings. For example, he says in Ezekiel uh, 38, 13, it is said that in the latter days, Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish with all the young lions thereof were to be associated in commerce and in war. It says here, in view of the overthrow of Tyre, Isaiah wrote in uh, 23, 1, how all ye ships of Tarshish, he says, it was revealed to them from the land of Chittim. The message came to Javan and Dan, which is England and Ireland. All right, Javan sons of Japhet. Yeah, originally, all that area was uh, given to Japhet's kids. Across the Straits of Dover from France, as we call it in the next verses, be still ye inhabitants of the Isle, to whom the merchants of Sidon that pass over the sea have replenished. All right, so it's a lot of commerce going on with Tarshish. He, he says here, the escaped of Israel and the preserved of Israel were sent over to Tarshish and the Lord promises them four things, the comely and the beautiful, the excellent and the glorious. It says here, it is said in Psalms, uh, what's that? I'm not sure if that's 72, 10, the kings of Tarshish and of the Isles shall bring presents. The people on the Isles of the West were always a noble, generous folk, all right? Isles, so British Isles. It says here, of Tyre, it is said, Javon was thy merchant in all riches with silver, iron, tin, and lead. They traded in thy fairs in Dan, Ireland, and here associated with Javon of England. In the same chapter, it is said, the ships of Tarshish did sing of thee in thy market, and thou was replenished. All right, so basically what he's trying to point out is it's matching. It's matching the history of the British Isles, the trade they had going on with ancient peoples, metal, same thing. It all matches the biblical stuff what Tarshish was. Jeremiah uh, 10.9 tells us that silver spread into plates was brought from Tarshish. All historians know that the Western Isles supplied the East with all manner of elaborately wrought metals of gold and silver and brass, bright iron and tin. Right? So that's even historic. It matches historical accounts of this area. Turn to Homer, book 18, and read a free translation describing the smelting operations going on in the foundries on the Tarshish Isles or Isles of Tarshish. All right, even Homer wrote about it. So it says, Baal worship and Judaism had formed an alliance on the Western Isles at this time under the name Druidism. All right, so so-called Hebrews had something to do with Druidism. All right, we're going to get more into all this. And this was the prevailing religion in those countries. To Tarshish, Jonah was bound. All right, so he's saying that's where he went. All right, so we go to a part that says here, God with Israel. And uh, he quotes a lot, uh, this person, Sharon Turner, which wrote a very historic uh, scholarly book. There's this one right here. It says here, the history of the Anglo-Saxons comprising the history of England from the earliest period to the Norman conquest by Sharon Turner. 
All right, this is volume one. This is from 1820. This is almost 1700s. Uh, he says, Sharon Turner states that although the Saxon name became on the continent the appellation of a confederacy of nations, yet at first it denoted a single state, and it appears they were so much isolated that the Romans did not come into contact with them. Though continually devastating by fire and sword, the people intervening between them and the Saxons. Continuing, he says, as to the Angles and Utes, their names were simply territorial appellations. Angles and Angulos, example, the Angles, the shape of the land they had been occupying in Utes from their land jutting out into the sea. That the Saxons, Utes, and Angles were kindred nations and of the same people. I think all admit it is clear from the identity of their language. And on ethnological grounds, they were branches of the same stock with some dialectic differences of pronunciation, but no real diversity of language. An ancient historian says the Utes were Hebrews of the tribe of Dan, all right? Just like we actually learned in my Danite videos. Make sure to catch those videos again. And that the Utes, Angles, and Saxons were kindred nations. So if all these people are, you know, from the tribe of Israel, you know, sons of Jacob, then yeah, they would be kindred nations. So again, he's quoting a source right here. You guys can go look for it. What makes this statement the more valuable is the fact that the tribe of Dan had two portions in Israel, one on the sea coast, the other inland near Lebanon. We must therefore naturally expect that the one portion of the tribe of Dan should appear with this division of their brethren, the other having escaped and arrived in Ireland some centuries before and were known as the Tuata de Danan. All right, we went over this again in my Danite videos. This is real history right here. The Saxons are represented in Brewer's historical atlas as telling their own story. Thus, they came, they said, of the three stouter people of Germany. Example, the Saxons, Angles, and Jutes. That's where they came from. Gretan, in his history of the Netherlands, this word means lower land, states how the Saxons were all driven from Germany. Clotair, the second, exterminated any who remained behind that he caused every one of them to be beheaded who exceeded the height of his sword, and thus he drove them out of Europe. Hmm, I wonder if he was a Roman. Continuing, we're on page 131, it says the new name. We will now look around us for our Saxon ancestors and see if we can find any links connecting to our fathers with those wanderers in the country and cities of the Medes. Where did this large body of enterprising men go to? Where did our Saxon ancestors come from? The grave of the wanderers became the cradle of the Saxons. Dr. Abadi Amsterdam in 1723 said, Unless the ten tribes have flown into the air or have plunged into the center of the earth, they must be sought for in the north and west and in the British Isles. First, as to the name Saxon, the dictionaries say it comes from sexy, a short sword. But short swords or long knives were in use thousands of years before we hear any such word as Saxon. As the new name by which the Lord's people are to be known, when he calls them to their own land, Isaiah tells us that it shall be a new name which the mouth of the Lord shall name. We are to find the new name in the word of the Lord, not that we are to look for the new revelation from God. It is to be found in the one he has given. In former times, this people were called Hebrews. Then children of Abraham, then sons of Jacob, and children of Israel, all right? It's a lineage. It's not a religion. But as we come down the steam of time, we find they are called sons of Isaac. Uh-oh, Isaac. In the closing books of the Old Testament, we find the new name. This also had been clearly revealed by God to Abraham when he made the promise, for he said in Genesis 21 12 and isaac shall thy seed be called this passage has been repeated on and on through the ages until paul tells us and isaac shall thy seed be called also and isaac shall thy seed be called in that passage how in isaac dropped the letter i which is very common in the east and we have sack all right pay attention to this part guys all right drop the letter i from isaac i remember isaac if you guys don't know is a son of Abraham. He is the father of Jacob and Esau. So when you're saying you're a line of sack, 
right, of Isaac. You're from the line of Isaac. So again, if you drop the I, we have sack. The letter C is often found turned to K and often to X. So we have sacks, which with their termination ons gives us Saxons, Isaac's sons, okay? Isaac's sons, the sons of Isaac, which is Jacob, right? Meaning Israelites, the sons of Isaac. But don't get that confused because that also can include Esau. But that's a big drop right there. You know, it's not us making this up. It says Dr. W. Holt J. says the word Saxon comes from son of Isaac. Son of Isaac by dropping the prefix I and adding the affix uns. He gives us sack, sock, sock, sax, saxon, saxon, and saxon. He shows that in most of the Eastern languages, sons of is written stunia. Okay, so again, remember Jacob is a son of Isaac. Jacob is Israel. As with us in Scotland, Mac means son of, thus MacDonald, son of Donald, and Fitz in England, thus Fitz William, son of William, and O in Ireland as O'Connell, Ebu in Arabian, Bar in Hebrew, Ben in Persian, Ap in Welsh, Ez in Spanish, Vaughn in Germany, Vaughn in Dutch. So in the East, Saxonia means sons of Sac or sons of Isaac. Saxon, right? Saxon. It is a little curious to glean from the history of those ancient nations and from the stone monuments of those early times, the various forms in which this word is to be found. I will here insert a few from a list of my own, gleaned from ancient history, found on tombs, tablets, monuments, and inscriptions in various languages. Now he goes and quotes, Now therefore hear thou the word of the Lord. This is from Amos 7. Thou sayest, prophesy not against Israel, and drop not thy word against the house of Isaac. The house of Isaac. House of Isaac, sons of Isaac, sons of Sac, and he got all these different, look at this, Sakai, the Ben Sakai, so the Sakai, Saka, that's Isaac, Sakai, Sunai, Sexy, Sak, Saki, Sacha, Saka, Sakus, Saxo, Saxonia, Saxons, Saxon, Saxony, all right? Sons of Isaac, you guys get it? They gloried in being Isaac's sons. A simple change of accent makes the Isaac sons and dropping the initial vowel, which forms no part of the root of the word and represents a jot, the smallest letter of the Hebrew alphabet, it becomes sax sons, which combined into one word is saxon, or X is equivalent to CS. Thus, we have a simple and natural origin in Isaac. All right? That's what Saxon comes from. Isaac. It is a fulfillment of the promise to Abraham. In Isaac shall thy seed be called, because through Isaac Jacob came, and through Jacob the twelve tribes of Israel. That's why. That's the fulfillment right there. When God gave to Abraham the promise of the many nations, he named their father the child of promise. Sarah, thy wife, shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac. When the strife arose between Sarah and Hagar, God commanded him to hearken to his wife and name the nations of promise as he had formerly named the child of promise. In Isaac shall thy seed be called. The promised seed embracing the many nations are called in Isaac, okay? Not Ishmael. That's what they're telling you right here. Not Ishmael and Isaac. They are named from him as well as descended from him. Hence the company of nations, a confederation. Promised to Jacob are called the Saxon nations. This name appears in various forms in history, but with the same radical significance. Max Mueller shows that Sunu is the San Chris and Suna, the Saxon, for son. Hence the word in its early form in Sakasuna. All right, Sakasuna, that's Isaac's son. By the Greeks, they were called Sakia, Sakia. By the Romans, Sakae, and afterwards, Saxons. All right. 
that was just referring to the sons of Isaac. All these are patronymics, meaning sons of Sakor, Saka, two forms of Isaac. John Milton in his History of Britain thus speaks of the Saxons. They were a people thought by good writers to be descended of the Sakae, a kind of Scythian in the north of Asia, then called Sakasons, or sons of Sakae, who with a flood of other northern nations came into Europe toward the declining of the Roman Empire, as soon as they conquered the Romans, right? Against the sons of Isaac, sons of Sakae, this great Saxon, who was an Israelite indeed, and whom was no guile, perceived at once a radical significance in the name Saxons, and through his extensive researches, that they were the descendants of the ancient Sakae and were of Scythian origin. According to Ezra 8, 17, Israel, at the time of the Jewish return from Babylon, had proceeded northward to Kasifia, the snowy mountainous Caucasian region, here they sojourned a while and gave their name to one of the most fertile tracts of Armenia, bearing the name of their father Isaac and their ethnical name of Sakae or Sakasuna. They called the country where they sojourned after themselves Sakasina. Strabo, the elaborate Grecian geographer who flourished shortly before Christ, mentions it repeatedly and extols the beauty of its climate. He also says the Sakae occupied Bactriana and got possession of the most fertile tract in Armenia which was called, after their own name, Sakasini. All right, so you guys remember my Sumerian video? They got driven out, actually, from this whole area right here by the Sumerians. Yeah, Japheth's people, the Sumerians coming out of Goma, Gomeri, Sumeri. Yeah, they got driven out, and they eventually ended up, you know, in the other lands where they became the Saxons. They advanced even as far as the Cappadocians, those particularly situated near the Exun, who are now called Pontisi. Again, he says, the river Araxis flows to the extremities of Albania and empties itself into the Caspian Sea. Next is Sakasini, which borders upon Albania and the river Cyrus. Starin Turner, again, quoting the other historian from 1820 in the other book, at the beginning of the present century, published in three volumes a valuable history of the Anglo-Saxons, which has passed through five editions. In tracing their origin, he finds them in this very region. And in these very people, the Sakae, referring to the testimony of Herodotus, he says, the first scenes of their civil existence and of their progressive power were in Asia, to the east of the Araxes. Here they multiplied and extended their territorial limits for some centuries unknown to Europe. All right? History of the Anglo-Saxons, volume one, we got that. He also says to this judicious and probable account of Herodotus, we add the information collected by Diodorus. He says that the Scythians, formerly inconsiderable and few, possessed a narrow region on the Araxes, but by degree, they became more powerful in numbers and in courage. They extended their boundary on all sides till at last they raised their nation to great empire and glory. So he goes on about the Sakai and, and the Saxon line, going back to the Israelites and where they were referenced to by many different writers. Again, so Pliny says the Sakai were among the most distinguished people of Scythia, who settled in Armenia and were called Sakasani. Remember, that means sons of Isaac. Albinus said the Saxons were descended from the ancient Sakai of Asia, and that in process of time they came to be called Saxons. All right, the sons of Isaac. For Duke says the Cimbrians, all right, these are the Sumerians too, were driven from their country. So I guess the uh, Scythians had gotten back by a people called the Asakai, who came from between the Euxine and the Black Seas, and from whom came those Angli, all right, the Angles, Anglos, who with the Saxons, Anglo Saxons, their family, afterwards took possession of England. And that's your whole Anglo Saxon invasion. It's not so called pale skinned people only, like how we were brought up to think. We're in the book, The Ruling Races of Prehistoric Times in India, Southwestern Asia, and Southern Europe by J. F. Hewitt, late commissioner at Chota, Nagpuri. This is from 1894. As we're talking about the Scythians or Sakas or the sons of Sakas or Isaac, Isaac, sons of Isaac. And something very interesting here when they're referencing a certain people, the Saramati, they're saying our descendants, as it says here, Herodotus describes as living in Tarik 
Chornissos and who are, he tells us, the descendants of the Amazons or matriarchal tribes, the Amazonian women, and the Scythians or Sakas, all right, Scythians, sons of Isaac, and the Amazonian women, the worshippers of the rain or wet sack god. It was these people who, as they went southward, made the Sarasvati, the river of Herat, descending from the mother mountain of the east, their mother river, and spread themselves over India as the great Naga, the great Naga race, descended from Ida or Ida, their sheep mother in their northern home of Phrygia and Mysia. All right. So the Scythians mixing with the Amazonians, you get the Nagas. Who's the Nagas? Remember our videos on the Mayas and the Nagas and how they became the Nagas. So it's all connecting. Who's the Scythians against? Or the Sakas, the sons of Isaac. All right. So remember, I'm skimming through this book. I want to get to some other parts. There's a lot of stuff to read here. And if you want to go over it, you know, make sure to find the book. I'm going to share this on my Patreon page so people can have it there. Um, we go to a part here where it says Ireland. All right. And a little further ahead, he says, The first inhabitants of Ireland, as the records show, were children of Japheth. One Partholan sailed through the straits called the Ends of the Earth, south of Spain, and reached a well-wooded island. He was a double parasite and his posterity was cut off by a dreadful pestilence. Not one of the family was left. The second immigration was the Formorians. Relations to the Numidians, all right, we're talking about Hamites, possibly very giant or very tall, who were driven north by the terrors of war. They were called sea kings. They came from North Africa. That's what, you know, it's assumed because they, you know, they know they are of dark complexion, so they try to Africanize them, but I believe they are Part of the Phoenicians are people coming out of Canaan, Hamites coming out of Canaan, you know, the true Canaan. The next wave of people that visited Jarishland or Ireland was a people called Baal Goy. They were worshippers of Baal, the sun god. They were of the old Hebrew stock and had fled from the wars in the east. Their leader's name was Nemed. They came through Europe from the Black Sea, through the great wilderness, as it was called, to the Baltic and thence to the land of sunsetting. They cleared 12 planes of wood, built two royal forts, established Baal worship, and exterminated the Fomorians. These people were called Vid or Fildbolg, or by others Vidi Pelgic, which means Belgic men. Dr. Moore derives the name from Balgoy. The round towers in Ireland and other monuments prove most plainly that one time Baal was worshipped here. Another wave of strangers from the east came to Ireland. Those persons came from the Meosaic or Moesia, sometimes called Moetia, near Trast. All right, so he goes over a lot of the uh, people coming into Ireland. Some of these we've gone over. Says an expedition from Hispaniola, now Spain, under eight sons of Milesios, right? The Milanations landed in the southwest of Ireland. Five of the sons were lost in a terrible storm. Heber, father of the Eberites, fell in battle on Grisho, Kings County. Hedemon, his brother, fixed his residence at Theomor, now Tara. A race of 20 kings of the same family came and went until the crown descended to Ola Fola of the family of Ir. He commenced his reign about 900 BC. He organized a grand, tri he organized a grand triennial meeting of the chiefs, which he named Fez. This meeting was composed of chiefs, priests, and bards, huh? Fez, huh? And it met at his castle in Tara. He caused a record to be made of the national events in a volume which was named the Psalter of Tara. Copies of these poetic records are still in existence. He reigned for 40 years with great honor and died a natural death, a very unusual circumstance in those times. His son reigned 17 years and died in the same manner. During the next 260 years, 31 kings wore the honors of royalty, and all but three of them fell in battle. Then he talks about the Danans, all right? We got this on my Danai video. The next company of newcomers was the Twata de Danan, or tribe of Dan. They were spoken of as accomplished soothsayers, necromancers, etc. Could quell storms, cure diseases, work in metals, foretell events, force magical weapons, and prove themselves mighty in war. The first company of the Danan settled near London, Derry, and after a time they went to England, then called Javan. All right? England was called Javan. They also visited Scotland. 
hearing of African pirates, they meant the Formorians, right? Not necessarily African. They came again to Ireland and sent the pirates out of the country and out of time and then held the country as Buchanan admits for 197 years, number the Tuatha de Danan, the tribe of Dan. About or during this time also came another company of the Tuatha de Danans, bringing with them a prophet of the Lord from Jerusalem. All right, we're talking about Jeremiah and Simon Baruch and a good company of the royal household with a royal outfit of these. We shall give minute information speedily. All right. So all of a sudden, right, we read this whole book and we got to the same part and the other book we've read earlier. Again, remember, we read part one of the other book, England, the remnant of Judah and Israel of Ephraim. And it told us here towards the end of the chapter that the royalty of Jerusalem had rehabilitated Judah of the West, that the remnant of Judah, which was the prince, the women, right, the princesses, including the king's daughters, which was warned to escape from Egypt in company with the prophet Jeremiah and promised protection if it did, that remnant making Judea its way to sanctuary. So real quick, again, we're in the book England, the remnant of Judah and the Israel of Ephraim. We're coming back to this book, all right, by F.R.A. Glover, M.A. And this is, again, chapter 2, and he's going on about Jeremiah, the prophet to the nations, to build and to plant. Where such an important part is attributed to the prophet Jeremiah as the rehabilitation of an embryo kingdom of Judah and Ireland, an event involving immense consequences, it would be natural to expect that some footmarks would be left by the way by which the steps of this great man might be tracked. Such unmistakable footmarks, if to be found, might be more reliable as evidence of his presence than any chronology of the times might afford. Even if such existed, seeing that they would be beyond suspicion of fabrication, accordingly, there are both personal and official, as well as legal marks of the Prophet's presence in Ireland at the proper time, independent of the priestly one of blessing the stone in inauguration of the new dynasty destined to perpetuate and redeem the forfeited promise to the line of David and to secure the continuance of the scepter of Judah. Such marks are discoverable in the various points as regards Jeremiah below enumerated. Number one, Olam Fola, the reputed king, sage, and legislator, and the College of Olams, which he founded at Tara. Number two, Ines Fail, the Isle of Destiny. Three, Jadhan Moran, the righteous judge. Four, Laya Fail, the stone of destiny. Five, the material fact. Six, Tara the name of the royal settlement of Ireland. Seven, the law of slavery, the seven years law of the Hebrews. All right, we just got about Torah right in the other book. Eight, the Irish mystery not to be uttered. Nine, the Scottish-Irish law of the sense. Ten, the genealogy. Eleven, the lion rampant of Scotland, the heraldic blazon. Twelve, the Hebraical etymological coincidences at Torah. 13, Moor or Lamin, the College of Prophets. All right, all right, so a little recap here. So we're talking about a lot of genealogies here. And um, as it says here in this graph, pretty good. I found it online. It says here the birthright and the scepter, Israel and Judah, the Hebrews, hidden in plain sight. And it starts with Abraham, of course, Isaac and his brother Ishmael, right? Arabs, as it says here, you see that? Arabs. And then Isaac, right? The sons of Isaac, Saxons, the sons of Sak. You got Jacob or Israel. And then Jacob had his 12 sons. One of them being Judah, who has the scepter or the birthright. He got with, we're going to see, we're going to learn today. We're going to learn about Tamar and his children with her. As you guys can see with her, there's two children, Perez Rath. And we got King David coming out of Ferez. That's what I was saying. So this line coming out of Ferez, because he came out first, but we'll see how he came out. He breached his way out. That's why he got the inheritance and not Sarah. We're going to read about that today. And again, through the Ferez line, you get King David, King Solomon, and King Sedekiah. You see? The person who got murdered by Nebuchadnezzar and whose heirs got killed. So through the line of David, there was no more male heirs. 
but there was another line, Shara. And you guys can see here King Harriman. We're going to learn about him and Princess Teffy. Now, before we continue with all this, I'm going to backtrack. We're going to go back in time again. We're going to go right back to Egypt, right? <laughs> the Exodus. We're going to read a couple other books. We're going to go back uh, to a quote from Diodorus about Cadmus and Danans. A little recap. And we're also going to get a great book on the history of Caledonia. Caledonia and other ancient nations that we assumed were other peoples it had nothing to do with Israel, but we're going to see our Israelites, so-called Hebrews. We're going to read a book from Diodorus. We're going to go back. So we're going to go read these books and we'll work all the way back to this point again in the British Isles. Get into the works of Diodorus of Sicily. Yeah, the famous Diodorus, they always quote, right? The Greek historian. We're going right into volume 12. All right. And we're going to be reading from book 40, the last book in the last chapter. All right. So we barely flop to this part of the book on book 40, where Diodorus basically gives his overview of the history of the Hebrews. Right. And the reason he does that is because he's going to show the relationship between the ancient Greeks and these so-called Jews or Hebrews. It says here, now that we are about to record the war against the Jews, we consider it appropriate to give first a summary account of the establishment of the nation from its origins and of the practices observed among them. When in ancient times a pestilence arose in Egypt, the common people ascribed their troubles to the workings of a divine agency. For indeed, with many strangers of all sorts dwelling in their midst and practicing different rites of religion and sacrifice, their own traditional observances in honor of the gods had fallen into disuse. Hence, the natives of the land surmised that unless they removed the foreigners, their troubles would never be resolved. All right. So Diodorus is talking about literally the plagues of Egypt that we read about in the Bible. You know what we read about with Moses doing with the help of the most high with the staff and everything so that pharaoh can let his people go now the way theodorus is writing about it he's saying there was a pestilence and that they were causing trouble to the native population the egyptians right the descendants of mizraim and kush he don't mention that they were actually enslaving these other people that they wanted to get rid of we know the other side of the story so they wanted to get rid of the so-called Jews or Hebrews, right? These foreigners in Egypt. At once, therefore, the aliens were driven from the country. And at the most outstanding and active among them banded together. And as some say, were cast ashore in Greece and certain other regions. So listen to what Theodorus is letting you know that during the Exodus, right? Literally, this is what he's talking about. They weren't driven out from the country. They left. They rebelled and freed themselves from bondage out of Egypt. They left to help the Most High. And Theodorus is letting you know that during this exodus, right, of the Israelites, Hebrews, they banded together and some say were cast ashore in Greece and certain other regions. Their leaders were notable men, chief among them being Danaus. Okay, Danaus. Danaus in Greek mythology was the king of Libya. His myth is a foundation legend of Argos, who's the Argives is Danites too, as one of the foremost Mycenaean cities of the Peloponnesus and Homer's Iliad, Danans, tribe of Dan or Danaus, the Argives. Again, Danaus and the Danans are the Danites. They did come out of the Exodus and also Cadmus, yes, the historical, mythical Cadmus, right? In Greek mythology, Cadmus was the legendary Phoenician founder of Boetian Thebes, the founder of Thebes, okay? Who? Cadmus, who? An exiled Israelite. I'm not the one saying that. Theodorus is telling us Danaus and Cadmus, they're supposed to be. Mythical people, half-gods, 
And like I've been showing you, these Greeks turned a lot of these antediluvian people, characters into gods and created a mythological story about their origins. But again, Phoenician Cadmus, who's the Phoenicians? Remember in my Nations of the World Danite video? So who are the Phoenicians? You always got to really study that. Get specific when they're saying Phoenician. Either way, Phoenicia, the land of Phoenicia, was in Canaan, the promised land. That was in America. You already know these people wore feather crowns. We got that on the last video. So Diodorus is letting you know, again, they became leaders and notable men. These people coming out of the exodus from Egypt, these Israelites, like Danaus and Cadmus. But the greater number were driven into what is now called Judea, which is not far distant from Egypt and was at that time utterly uninhabited. The colony was headed by a man called Moses, outstanding both for his wisdom and for his courage. So who are we talking about? Judea, Moses, people coming out of Egypt, same people that Danaus and Cadmus came out of. This is Theodorus letting you know, supposedly in the first century BC, according to their hijack chronologies, right? But they're letting you know still who these people are. Again, confirming what we've been already going over. On taking possession of the land he founded, remember that it wasn't Moses exactly who actually who reached Jerusalem, but Joshua, his successor. Besides other cities, one that is now the most renowned of all, called Jerusalem. Now listen to Theodorus's telling people about Jerusalem like they've never heard about it. This is a very old primary source. Letting you know who Danaos and Cadmus people are, the same people who founded Jerusalem, who followed their leader Moses, who came out of Egypt to marry the real Egypt, America, to marry. We're in the book, The Ruling Races of Prehistoric Times in India, Southwestern Asia, and Southern Europe by J.F. Hewitt, late commissioner at Chota, Nagpuri. This is from 1894, page 517. In regard to the uh, Dorian Confederacy, it says here, the nation who worshipped Apollo, the Dorian god, were a people who made their year begin with the rising of Sirius at the summer solstice and were the Dorian confederacy of the Spartiates or Spartans, the sown race who were born from the teeth of the serpent sown by Cadmus. Cadmus? And it was they who were changed from an agricultural people into the great conquering warrior tribe, the most warlike of the Greek races by the coming of the Cretan and Asiatic races of Dravidian stock called the Pamphili or union of all tribes the carefully drilled and organized confederacy of tribes whose ethnological history I have analyzed in essay 3. All right, so who are the Spartans coming out of Cadmus, so-called Greeks? We already know Cadmus coming out of Egypt and Israelite. We're on page 519 of this book. To the Mycenaeans, the Trojans, and Tyrians as a Semitic people. The whole scene as told in mythic legend speaks of the coming from the north of the young prophet God who was born in a land ruled by Semitic trading races from the far east. These were the Minyai, all right? The farthest east is America. The farthest, farthest east, all right? These were the Minyai, whose gods were not the personified powers of nature of the Aeolic races, not like the Javan people or Japhetic people's gods. The actual morphic gods of the five worshippers or the local village gods of the matriarchal races but symbols of metaphysical conceptions the crescent moon the heavenly ship with the tour or pole in which was hidden as in the heavenly mist the seed of life the unseen and mysterious father god who was only known in life he diffused throughout the world and his unchanging laws the worship of this god was conducted with silence and with a long series of elaborate ceremonies which were meaningless except to those initiated in the mysterious doctrines of the faith whose priest kings, all right, whose priest kings, we're talking about so-called Hebrews, whose priest kings, Akan, right, Prester John, priest king, and their satellites tried to make the laws governing the lives of the people similar and their unbending regularity to the laws of nature, all right, we're just talking about keeping the code. 
Life from its commencement was trammeled with rules and existence was passed in a series of consecration ceremonies, penances, ablutionary cleansings, and expiations, such as those we find in the Levitical laws, just like the ones in Levitical laws copied from the priestly recollections of the older Semitic ritual in the Vendidad of the Senda Vesta and the Brahmanas, all right? But who really created those? Are we just talking about Nagas, Maya? And the tyranny which ruled in matters of religion was extended to every department of government. Hence, it is that the rule of the Semitic Minjae is marked by the citadels of Mycenae, all right? And Tyrians. And by the two Pelasgic walls which fortified the first Acropolis at Athens. We're just talking about Hebrews with Levitical laws, okay? It was these people who were the great building race. These were the architects who built the pyramids ruled by priest kings architects who are priest kings like the patesi of irsu whose building could in the absence of mechanical appliances only be carried on by an unlimited use of forced labor and we find an echo of the detestation with which their rule was regarded in the book of samuel who was as I have shown in SA3, the first prophet king, Samla of Masreka. Okay? He's saying Samuel is the same as Samla of Masreka, the prophet king. It's the same person. He's letting you know these are historic people. That's what I've been trying to show you. Or the Vineland, and whose history opens with an account of the evil deeds of the sons of Eli, the priest king. It was the people who groaned under this tyranny who gladly rose against their oppressors when the people who worshiped the young son and prophet god of the Aryans appeared from the north, who's the Aryans, Aryan means noble, and delivered the agriculturists, artisans, and shepherds from the despotic rule of the Semitic feudal lords, whose wealth and trading instincts are shown by the rich treasures found in Mycenae, Tyrans, and Troy. All right? These people are all related. We're just talking about so-called Hebrews. It was these merchant princes, merchant princes who substituted the rule of the single king or tyrant for his myrmidons, the priestly caste of the Levites, for the tribal form of confederacy of two kings of Sparta, watched by the five Evers. And it was they who introduced slavery and made the Phoenician sea rovers the suppliers of slaves throughout the Mediterranean countries their Asiatic, so-called Asiatic and Semitic origin, Shemitic, is shown by the division in Troy, Mycenae, and Tyrians of the houses into male and female apartments, and this separation of the sexes and the seclusion of married women, which originated with the Semites, continued to be the rule of home life at Athens, while the liberty and careful education given to women by the matriarchal races survived in the Hetairai, who were as Aspasia was to Pericles, the chosen companions and advisors of the leading men of the country. It was these Semites who gave the name of place of peace, Salem, to Salamis, and gave to the Greek language its name Shkrusos, or gold, which is the Hebrew Charas, the ages during which this Semite dominion lasted have left but few traces in Greek legend, all right? This is what I've been trying to show you guys. And we got a future video to break this into one, you know, uh, topic like that Greek is a misnomer a lot of times. They grouped a lot of different people under Greek. And a lot of these people are Japheth's people, Ham's people, and Semites, Hebrews, Israelites, as we're reading right now. They had dominion in these lands, so-called Greek lands, right? He's saying here they left few traces in Greek legend, but its end is marked by a most prolific age of mythical history. The myth of the Greeks is real people. I'm going to show you guys. Remember, we've gone over this. There's so-called Phoenician gods, so-called Atlantean gods. Who's the Atlanteans? This is all going back to the promised land, Canaan, Atlantis. Call it what you like. Ancient America. So to the Greeks, it became a mythical history, which records and varying versions of the birth of the sun god, who ruled the solar year, the returning Heraclite, or worshippers of the gods of light.
All right, so real quick, I just want to read、uh, from this. This is actual writings of、uh, Tacitus. All right, a famous historian, Greek historian, right? So-called Greek. The histories of Tacitus, an English translation with introduction, front piece notes, maps, and index by George Gilbert Ramsey. You know, and he's a part of all this stuff right here. This is from 1915. So this is a translation of Tacitus,、uh, Plinius Tacito, right?、Uh, five books. We're gonna go to book number five. All right, so all the way in book number five,、uh, this is about page 398. It says here about the Jews, right? So-called. Jews. I just want to show you. Here says they're coming from、uh, Crete. Yeah, it says the story goes that the Jews were fugitives from the island of Crete, who settled upon the extreme borders of Africa. So, extreme borders. So they weren't in Africa or coming from Africa, right? Either. First of all, so he said they were coming from Crete, that island with the Mycenaean Empire, right? The Mycenaeans, who were practicing Levitical laws, who are Israelites. We got Tacitus. Letting us know that the story, what he heard, you know, that the Jews were fugitives from the island of Crete. You know, they were fleeing Egypt. Remember, they were still fleeing. They were still on the move. All right. So again, remember, I told you guys we're gonna get into a lot of books. We're gonna try to put it all together and、uh, just show you that a lot of people are saying the same thing. And who are these nations of the world? Why were they fighting with certain other nations of the world? It all start making sense. And when little by little we start seeing, you know, these so-called Hebrews or Israelites influence in history more and more, and who they were in history. So let's continue.、It、says here we're going to read from this book, Ancient History of Caledonia, written by Saint Chaldean and the other saints of the Chaldean faith, and chiefly by the Johnstones, who held the royal pen for many hundreds years. Translated from the Latin. By the Reverend Duncan McGregor, published by John McLaren Seaman Dunnan. Before I continue, I just want to show you, in case you guys don't know what Caledonia is, we have mentioned it in my Ireland or or of the Chaldees, Chaldi, Chaldi, Caledonian, Chaledonian, Chaldi, Chaldi. Either way, Caledonia says here was the land name used by the Roman Empire to refer to the part of Great Britain. That lies north of the River Forth, which includes most of the land area of Scotland. Today, it is used as a romantic or poetic name for all of Scotland. Caledonians, or Caledonis, Caledoni, or the Caledonian Confederacy were a Britonic-speaking Celtic tribal confederacy in what is now Scotland during the Iron Age and Roman eras. The Greek form of the tribal name gave rise to the name Caledonia for their territory. The Caledonians were considered to be a group of the Britons, who are the Britons, Brat, Brit. But later, after the Roman conquest of the southern half of Britain, the northern inhabitants were distinguished as Picts. Who's the ancient Picts, huh? Thought to be a related people who would have also spoken a Britonic language. The Caledonian Britons were thus enemies of the Roman Empire, enemies of Edomites. So, who are the Caledonians fighting the Romans, huh? Which was the state then administering most of the Great Britain. So the Romans had invaded. So they're, you know, like the pigs and Britons. They're pre-Viking, pre-Roman. They were there from ancient times in these lands. Now we know where Caledonia is, right? So we got the history of Caledonia book. We're going back to, and this book is from 1874. Just want to show you guys some of the contents here. There's a lot of info here. We're not gonna read the whole book, but we're gonna get to some parts here. Just want to show you what they start talking about right away, okay? And it says here, introductory, right?、It、says pages one, two. The Israelites, being oppressed by the Egyptians, several tribes escaped to the desert. They arrive in Greece and found the city of Troy. Who? Israelites founded Troy. Yes, we're gonna get into that more and more. We just read from the other book that Troy Mycenaean Tyrians were practicing Hebrew customs, Levitical laws, and things like that. Okay. Then it says here dispute with Greeks and siege of Troy. So who's the so-called Greeks that invaded Troy? If you guys remember my Danite video, these so-called Greeks were actually Danites. Yeah, it's Danites fighting against. A possible line of Sarah, which comes out of Jude, Judah, yeah, sons of Judah. 
and you can read things like that in the Bible. There's times when the Israelis are fighting amongst each other. This is real history right here. Now, before I read this uh, book, he explains how he got this uh, transcript, this old Latin uh, document. He says, I think it necessary to state how I became possessed of the original copy of the ancient history of Caledonia. I was a sailor on board a man of war, returning in 1842. I was one day sent on store duty to the Tower of London. One of my shipmates calling me by name, a gentleman who heard him came to me and said, Am I like Jock at the fair? Are there more McLaurins here than me? I answered that I was a McLaurin. We became very intimate. He was master gunner at the tower, by name David McLaurin. I remained there all night, and the topic of conversation happened to fall upon nationality. He informed me that he had seen a book in the shop of a Jew in Petticoat Lane with the word Chaldea, Chaldea, Caledonia, Chaldea, Chaldea, marked upon it. Through curiosity, I went along with him to see it. What he called the book turned out to be a large roll of written skins, not very well preserved, there being holes here and there, and the writing in many places injured by damp. An oaken box which had contained the roll attracted my attention. It was lined with copper and had outside on the lid a great many ornaments in the same metal, including a large lion rampant with a sword in its paw. Lion, right? I offered him a sum of money for the box, but he would not part with it until he had first removed the mountain from it. I then offered him a piece of money for the book, which he refused. But when I left, he followed after me with it, insisting that I should take it at the price offered. And to avoid being mobbed, I paid the book, got possession of it, and left. After returning home, I tried several clergymen with it, but received no encouragement. Until I met with Reverend Duncan McGregor, Roman Catholic priest, Lockaber. He told me it was the ancient history of Caledonia. All right. So remember, let's go back. He says that the actual book cover said Chaldea marked upon it. Remember, he said it said Chaldea. Why would it say Chaldea? But it actually means the ancient history of Caledonia. Where is ancient Chaldea? Again, check out my Ireland or of the Child D series, and you'll see why. He translated it from the ancient Latin in which it was written into the Gaelic language, as I expected from the nature of the book that it would command a greater sale in that language. From various causes, it never was printed in Gaelic. But from this translation, I have now got it translated into the English language, the original document being completely destroyed during the first translation by the means taken to make the writing legible. I was in Lord Royal's employment on his estate of Duncrop near Dunnan about the year 1862. I told his lordship of the former existence of a tower on his estate, which I knew of from the history. Becoming interested, he made inquiries on the subject, but the oldest man in the neighborhood had never heard of it. He then ordered a search to be made under my direction, which was successful in laying bare the foundations of the tower. Several other statements in this history are proved by recent discoveries. For example, the sinking of St. Andrews has been verified by the fishermen who have discovered walls and other remains three miles out at sea. The prophecies of St. Mac Isaac are partly fulfilled. Son of Isaac, all right? Sons of Isaac, Saxon. <laughs> the original writing from which this history is translated are believed to have been carried away by Edward I along with the marble chair and Jacob's pillow. Jacob's pillow, we're talking about the stone of destiny, upon which the Caledonians crowned their kings at Scone Palace. The Caledonians, the ancient Scottish people, who brought the stone? Remember, it was Jeremiah. Jeremiah, it's all connected. John McLaren, okay? So he's saying he was able to prove already some things with this translation. And we're going to get a little bit of that translation. It says here, ancient history of Caledonia. After the death of Pharaoh, who loved Joseph, the king of Egypt, and his rulers saw that the Hebrews prospered more than the Egyptians, that their fields and their vines were more fruitful and pleasant, and also that their wives and daughters were more fair and beautiful than their own. Pharaoh, the king, then made a law that all those who did not bow down the knee to the bull and offer sacrifices upon the king's altar were to be double tied and their children brought into slavery, which grieved the Hebrews very much. But they still remembered their God, 
and went to the desert and offered sacrifice to the God of Bethel. Pharaoh then, being proud of this, brought all the Hebrews under slavery. The Egyptian slaves got straw to make their bricks, but the Hebrews had to collect stubble and make the same number of bricks as the Egyptians, which made their task very grievous to bear. But they still trusted that God would deliver them from bondage. The king Pharaoh was enraged and ordered all the Hebrew children to be slain when they were born. This caused several of the tribes of the Hebrews to draw together, who never defiled themselves among the Egyptians. They then departed into the desert and withdrew themselves from among them. Pharaoh the king, being rough, pursued them into the desert with horses and chariots. The Israelites, all right, now they're not just Hebrews, they're Israelites specifically, seeing Pharaoh's host at hand, cried to the God of Bethel to deliver them from the hand of their enemy. Then the God of heaven raised his storm of wind and sand, mountains high, so that they could not find them, and afterwards left them to wander through the desert of Assyria, chiefly living upon fruit. All right, remember, they're over here kind of going almost with the story of Moses, right? Exodus coming out of Egypt. A different take on it here. The king of Greece observing encampments and being at war with the Egyptians and Assyrians sent an ambassador to inquire if they had broken the truce that had been made. But they found nothing but working men of crafty work. Now, now real quick, so you guys don't get confused. They're in the wilderness, right? They're in the desert. The Israelites just left Egypt during their exodus. They reached these lands where there's a king, so-called king of Greece. This is the Danite. This is when the Danites were ruling this part of Greece. This was the Danite. We got the other side of the story in my Danite videos. And you're going to see he didn't make war with these Israelites. So he's like, go spy on them. So he had sent somebody to spy on them. And then the person said, hey, I'm only finding working men of crafty work, namely copper, brass, dyeing and weaving, and also brick making. The king then finding they were Hebrews, dispatched an Hebrew interpreter, whom they told that they were no rebellious people, that they were under the necessity of fleeing from Egypt to the desert from the oppression and cruelty of Pharaoh. The Hebrew servant returned and told the king of Greece that they were not men of war, but were working men of craftsmen of Egypt. The king, being pleased with such good news, sent his servant again, telling them to pitch their tents in any plain in his dominions where they pleased, telling them at the same time that they could worship their own God after their own fashion. Now, why would Greeks do that? Remember, this is a Danite. This is his people. Now, another thing I want to point out, he's saying working men of Egypt doesn't mean they're Egyptians. They were coming out of Egypt, just like a so-called gypsy is somebody who's coming out of Egypt or an Egyptian. They would be referred to as Egyptians or gypsies too. They're traveling right in the desert. It's all called gypsies. It's all going to combine. You guys will see. The Hebrews then built an altar to the Lord and offered sacrifice for the great deliverance and saving them from the hands of the Egyptians. The king of Greece visited their camps with his Hebrew servant, telling them to build a city and fortify themselves against their enemies, whoever they might be. They have confidence in this king of Greece. All right, they trust this king of Greece and seeing that the Lord's hand was in their deliverance, commenced to build their city of Troy. Who built Troy? Israelites. And we're going to see specifically who was the founder and from which tribe of the Israelites. All right. So again, these Israelites flee in Egypt. Exodus, just like Cadmus and Danan. We're talking about Israelites. Settling down, becoming great nations, these so called early Greek nations. Here's another case of it right here. They built the city of Troy. It was Israelites. The materials of which this city was built were bricks made of clay. This clay was dug made this clay was dug to make a canal round the whole city with drawbridges to draw up at any time for securing them from their enemies. The work went on so rapidly that they soon found themselves in a fortified position. And as the population increased, so did the city enlarge. The building going on with much vigor. And at the same time, the other tradesmen were employed at their own trades, supplying the other nations around them with purple scarlet and fine linen. Purple and wore instruments of brass, copper, and iron. This surprised the kings of Egypt very much. He having labored under the impression that all the Hebrews were consumed in the mountains of sand, which nearly destroyed the Egyptians, 
but these had rather served as a protection to the Hebrews. The king of Greece gave every encouragement to the Hebrews, so did he adhere to their ways that he was almost persuaded to worship their God. Almost. Remember, this is a Danite. A Danite who, you know, these were sea peoples. They had gone all over the world and mixed, and, you know, they were probably doing a little pagan stuff too. They become Hellenized. <laughs> But owing to his rulers, he almost started going back to Hawaii, it says here. But owing to his rulers being worshippers of the horse, they would not allow the king to turn from his former principle, namely worshipping the horse, as the priest persuaded the king if he would turn from worshipping the horse, as that was the god of the Grecians in those days, all right? So-called Grecians. That his charges would not face the battle, nor enter into the war chariots. Still, the king's heart was with the Hebrews, all right? This king, this Danite. He was with his brethren, and he allowed them to go on pilgrimage to the tops of the highest mountains to worship the God of heaven for his great deliverance of them from the cow worshippers of Egypt and the tyranny of Pharaoh. Cow worshippers of Egypt, huh? Just like the Hindus? Hmm. This was their custom for several hundreds of years until war fell out between Greece and Assyria. So they were there for hundreds of years, okay? The Israelites. The Hebrews then refused their young men to go to war, neither would they allow their daughters to be given in marriage to the uncircumcised Gentiles, unless they would consent to be circumcised and offer seven years sacrifice in worshiping the god of Bethel. Afterwards, one of the Grecian princes fell wroth with the inhabitants of Troy, probably called the Trojans. Who are the Trojans? Israelites. There was born to one of the princes of Troy a daughter that expelled in beauty and virtue all the Grecian nation. The prince of the Grecians offered her his hand in marriage, but was refused by the laws of the altar. He then besieged the city of Troy with rage and drove them into the city, thinking he would make them surrender from hunger. But they cried out to the Lord, and he heard their cry and was pleased to send shoals of fish of all kinds. But the sturgeon was considered the best fish, and therefore it was chosen for sacrifice on the altar. The turtle doves and pigeons were also innumerable around the city. They also made use of them for food, being also offered for sacrifice. The wild bee was also very plentiful, supplying them with honey. They lived there in comfort while their enemies were encamped around the city, suffering many privations. But the John generation arose, and new rulers refused to offer the sacrifices with the sturgeon, for as it was the best fish, they wished to keep it for themselves and offer other fish to the Lord. So remember, we're not reading the Bible. This is an old land document containing the history of Caledonia. All right. So because of what they were doing, most high stopped helping them. All right. So it keeps going. I just want you guys to see, you know, Troy was uh, built by Israelites, as it says in this uh, ancient document. All right. So the story keeps going. They eventually make it to, you know, England, Scotland. And after, you know, their travels through uh, Europe. After, you know, crossing the sea from the true promised land, ended up in Gaul, uh, Spain, Portugal, and then from there going to the British Isles. But for now, we're just going to continue real quick. I just want to show you guys, you know, who were the ancient Trojans really? So we got the Kenians or Aenians, the Danans, Cadmus people, the Trojans, Mycenaeans, Tyrians. All right, all right. So you guys are still with me? All right, so real quick, we're going to read from 1 Kings 4, specifically regarding how wise Solomon is, right? The Most High says, And Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the children of the East Country and all the wisdom of Egypt. For he was wiser than all men, than Ethan the Israelite, and Heman and Shalkol and Darda, the sons of Mahol. And his fame was in all nations round about. And he spoke 3,000 proverbs. And his songs were 1,005. All right. So that's just a little bit of the chapter. Why did I read this? Because he referenced that Solomon was wiser than Darda. Right. Who is Darda? Then Darda. Then Darda must have been a pretty wise person. All right. So remember, I see this as history, not as religion. We're making a lot of connections here. We're in Genesis 38. And it says here, And it came to pass at that time that Judah, 
went down from his brethren. He went down. He went down in many ways. You're going to see what I'm talking about. And turned unto a certain Adulamite, whose name was Hira. And Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite, whose name was Shua. And he took her and went into her, all right? <laughs> he literally went into her. So basically what they're saying is he had sexual relations with this woman. And out of that came some children. Now, when they're saying he went down from his brethren, there's a whole backstory depending on people's opinion of what they mean when he went down, meaning he went down on level. He wasn't supposed to go into a Canaanite woman, as they say here, go into. But he did. And she conceived and bore a son, and he called his name Ur, Ur, Ir, Ur. And she conceived again and bore a son, and she called his name Onan. So these are Judah's kids with the Canaanite woman, all right? And yet, again, conceived and bore a son and called his name Selah, or Selah. And he was at Shazib when she bore him. And Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn whose name was Tamar. All right, here goes Tamar. Tamari, Tamar. It was supposed to be a wife of his firstborn son, Ur. Judah arranged that. And Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked, though, in the sight of Hawa. And Hawa slew him, all right? Hawa got rid of him. He was wicked. That's Judah's son, all right? A line of Judah. He, got, he was wicked. Doesn't mean you're good just because you're from Judah got to have the spirit of Hawa. And Judah said unto Onan, his other son, go in unto thy brother's wife and marry her and raise up seed to thy brother. So Judah was like, all right, your brother's gone. You take Tamar as your wife now. And Onan knew that the seed should not be his. And it came to pass when he went in unto his brother's wife that he spilled it on the ground, lest he should give seed to his brother do you guys hear what's going on? So he ejaculated outside of, you know, the woman so he wouldn't have Tara, so he wouldn't have, you know, get her pregnant. This is literally what it just said. And the thing which he did displeased Hawa. Therefore, he slew him also. He's like, oh, so you just want to have so-called sex? Then said Judah to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, remain a widow at thy father's house until Shalah, my son, is grown. For he said, lest perhaps he die also as his brethren did, and Tamar went and dwelt in her father's house. All right, so he said, all right, don't go nowhere. As soon as my third son gets old enough, Shalah, make sure to go have a baby with him or get with him, right? And in process of time, the daughter of Shua, Judah's wife, died. All right, so all of a sudden, the Canaanite woman he had the babies with, she's gone, right? And Judah was comforted and went up unto his sheep shearers to Timnah, he and his friend Hira, the Adulamite. And it was told Tamar, saying, Behold, thy father-in-law goeth up to Timnah to share his sheep. And she put her widow's garment off from her and covered herself with a veil and wrapped herself and sat in an open place, which is on the way of Timnah. For she saw that Shelah was grown and she was not given unto him as wife. When Judah saw her, he taught her to be a harlot, hmm, a prostitute, because she had covered her face. So Judah thought he was going to a prostitute, right? Huh? So come again, Judah, right? Judah went unto a prostitute, right? Which he thought was a prostitute, and it was actually Tamar, because she had covered her face. She was undercover. And he turned unto her on the wayside and said, come. I pray thee, let me come in unto thee. <laughs> he said, I want to go have sexual relations with you. For he knew not that she was his daughter-in-law. He didn't know that was his daughter-in-law, according to the story, right? And she said, what wilt thou give me that thou mayest come in unto me? And he said, I will send thee a kid from the flock. And she said, will thou give me a pledge until thou send it? And he said, what pledge shall I give thee? And she said, thy signet and thy bracelets and thy staff that is in thy hand. And he gave it to her and came in unto her. All right. He had relations with her. And she conceived 
by him. And she got pregnant because of that. So that's Tamar and Judah, right? And she arose and went away and laid aside her veil from her and put on the garments of her widowhood. And Judah sent the kid by the hand of his friend, the Adulamite, to receive his pledge from the woman's hand. But he found her not. Then he asked the man of the place, saying, Where is this harlot who was openly by the wayside? And they said, There was no harlot in this place. And he returned to Judah and said, I cannot find her. And also the men of the place said that there was no harlot in this place. And Judah said, Let her take them for herself, lest we be shamed. Behold, I sent this kid, and thou hast not found her. And it came to pass about three months after that it was told Judah, saying, Tamar, thy daughter-in-law, hath played the harlot, and also, behold, she is with child by whoredom. And Judah said, Bring her forth, and let her be burned. So eventually, you know, as time went by, they found out Tamar, you know, was pregnant. And they said she did it through prostitution. So Judah was like, you know what? Bring her forth. Let's burn her. This is before he knew it was actually his baby. When she was brought forth, she sent to her father-in-law, saying, By the man whose these are, I am with child. And she said, Thy son, I pray thee, whose are these? The signet and bracelets and staff. And Judah acknowledged them and said, She has been more righteous than I, because I gave her not to Shalom, my son. And he knew her again no more. So he's like, Oh man, she did it because I didn't I keep my promise. I've given her to my son. And it came to pass in the time of her travail that, behold, twins were in her womb. So she ended up being pregnant by twins. And it came to pass when she travailed that the one put out his hand, and the midwife took and bound upon his hand a scarlet thread, saying, this came out first. Remember, whoever comes out first gets the inheritance, right? The right to rule. So whoever took out his hand, is the one that got a scarlet around his hand and said he came out first so they can be marked. And it came to pass as he drew back his hand that behold his brother came out and she said, How hast thou broken forth? This breach be upon thee. Therefore his name was called Perez, that is a breach. And afterwards came out his brother who had the scarlet thread upon his hand and his name was called Serah. So you guys hear what happened? Serah was actually the one who was coming out first. His hand was already out. And all of a sudden, Perez reached out. He said, no, it's me. He took the throne as a baby, like right away. His name, Perez, even means a breach. All right? You guys following so far? So Judah had two sons with Tamar. They were called Perez and Sarah. It says here, 1 Chronicles 2. It says here, the family of Israel. We're just going over. The sons of Judah, as it says here, the sons of Judah were Ur, Onan, and Shelah. These three were born to him by the daughter of Shua, the Canaanites. All right, we just got that in the other book. Ur, the firstborn of Judah, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, so he killed him. And Tamar, his daughter-in-law, bore him Perez and Sarah. All right, we, we just read how. So Perez and Sarah, all the sons of Judah were five. The sons of Perez were Hezron and Hamul. The sons of Sarah were Simri, Ethan, Haman, Kalko, where we get the Kalkis, and Dara, which is, as you guys see in the footnote, Darda, the same as Darda, as in 1 Kings 4.31, it's the same one, Darda, Dara, Darda, five of them in all. Now, what I want to point out is that, you know, through Judah's sons, their sons have many sons and many nations, all right, that are you know, of the line of Judah, so they might have carried a, a royal throne somewhere in part of the world. Just for example, I just want to show you guys, this is another chronology, so Darda, all right, now we know who is Darda, remember, he was referenced to be almost as wise as Solomon, but Solomon is wiser, but Darda, now we know Darda is a son of Sarah, who is a son of Judah, okay, Sarah, Darda, Judah. Welcome to the Stone Kingdom. My name is Colette Thomas-Smith. I am a researcher, author, historian, and genealogist. But basically, I am a cold case detective in ancient Mediterranean civilizations and history. 
my book, Zara of the Red Thread, Builders of the Stone Kingdom, is a complicated story covering the late Bronze Age to the Christian era. Who was Zara of the Red Thread? How did he get his name and his title? What was his role in ancient history and why didn't we ever hear of him? Why was he on royal genealogical charts in Ireland and in Britain and in Europe? These questions became the focus of 25 years of research on ancient British and Mediterranean history. Judah, one of the 12 tribes of Israel, had two twin boys. One of them almost birthed first. He put his little hand outside the birth canal and they wrapped a red silk thread around it so they'd know that he was the birthright child. Miraculously, he was not born first, but his brother Ferris which gave him the title of birthright child. Sarah, for the rest of his life, would have to live somewhere else and rule somewhere else wherever his brother did not rule. And so Sarah and all his many families left Egypt about 200 years before the time of Moses. In Egypt, Sarah was only mentioned one or two times and then in a census record, and then he disappears off of every record that is kept by the Old Testament. The quest for me was, so where did he go? What did he do? Zara's family became kings in Ireland, Britain, Scotland, and Denmark. They also populated most of what we know as Scandinavia. Spain, which was Iberia at the time. Greece, they were the kings of Troy. Athens, Tuscany, and the first kings of Rome, Austria, Lebanon, and all the islands of the Mediterranean from Crete on. So the Lion of Judah and the Unicorn of Ephraim are the crest of Great Britain. Ephraim came in as Scythians. Everyone had their name changed. Everything written about Western history will have to be questioned because we were all told the Western civilization started with the classical Greeks and the Romans, when in fact, they were the last ones to come in and be the real founders of Western civilization. All right, so real quick, just to go ahead and correlate what I was saying, what we're learning. I'm going to read from this book. It's called Judah's Scepter, A Historical and Religious Perspective. This is by Brian Arundel Howard of Wardour. And we're going to go to chapter one of this book. And it's actually called Jacob, Judah, Sarah, the Scepter, and Lion. Okay. So we go a little bit down in this chapter. Start right here. It says, the journey of Sarah is also part of the biblical story of Jacob of Israel and his connection with pillar stone in the desert. This is the stone that would become the witness to all future king thrones of Judah and Israel. The sons of Judah are Ur, Onan, Shalah, Farah, and Sarah. Ur and Onan died in the land of Canaan. The story of Sarah is about the Sarah Hebrew tribes of Judah, whose wife Tamar bore twins. Sarah revealed his right hand, of which his scarlet thread or cord was tied around the wrist. Remember the story that his hand came out first, and this whole a scarlet thread around the hand that's very famous in the British Isles. Sarah revealed his right hand, of which his scarlet thread of cord was tied around the wrist. His twin brother, Farah, however, or Perez, right, would be born first. He breached out, remember? Thus his brother Farah would steal his brother's birthright by coming out of the womb first. Farah became the messianic bloodline, the golden lion nation of Judah. And Sarah becomes the Gaelic Christian bloodline or scarlet lion nations of Judah. The descendants of Sarah are the Trojans, okay? Spartan, the Gaelic tribes that go back over 1400 years before Christ. All right, Gaelic, original Gaelic Trojan, Spartans. The tribe of Sarah fled out of Egypt before the great exodus by Moses, before the exodus. You can have a little time frame. Before the great exodus by Moses, Hebrew tribe under the Pharaoh Ramses. Sarah's journey started when he and his tribe moved out of the land of Egypt and across the coast of the Mediterranean to the Aegean Sea, 
all right, was the Aegeans, the so-called Greeks, and up into the Black Sea. The Sarah tribes transformed themselves over 2,000 years from the ancient tribes of the Mediterranean to the pre-Catholic kings of Western Europe. The biblical sons of Sarah were Simri, Ethan, He-Man, yeah, He-Man, son of Judah, right? Calco, all right, Calco, and Darda, Dardanos, all right, Darda, Dardanos, five of them in all. Dardanos, the founder of Troy's royal lineage. Chalcol established the great city of Athens, all right? Chalcol established Athens. Dardanus established Troy. And Simri established the Eastern Black Sea. Through these three sons nurtured and fathered the nations of ancient Mediterranean area and Europe. The other tribes and factions of Sarah moved from the Greek Isles and the Black Sea by land north or up the Danube River. These three sons of Sarah, however, are the most notable in history, who carried on to do great things for the populace and journey abroad, consolidating their culture, religion, and royal administration. The migration of the Sarah tribes are put into three groups and two main migration routes. The first group is Chalco, sons, who became the Malaysians, okay? Who became the Malaysians? Chalco. And again, who's Chalco? a son of Sarah, and who's Sarah, a son of Judah. So his sons again became the Malaysians, became the Hyksos, Egyptian, the Iberian, Spain, Irish, and Scots tribes who made their migrations by ocean. The second group comes out of Dardanus, sons, that become the Trojans, Celts, all right, the Celts, Franks, Scandinavians, and part of the British Isles. Now remember, in history, these people are dealing with Danites and also with other nations like the Sumerians. The third group came out of Simri and Colchis, sons who become the Scythians or Scots, Saxon and Subians of Scandinavia, okay? That migrated by land north and west into Europe. All right, Saxons, sons of Isaac, all these people, sons of Isaac, right? Because they come out of Isaac, then Jacob, then all the 12 tribes. We got Sarah coming out of Judah. And Sarah had all these kids. Simri cultures. Scythian Scots. Saxon Subians of Scandinavia. They migrated by land north and west into Europe. They all could speak and understand different variations of the Gaelic language. With its roots being Hebrew. The Gaelic being Hebrew. The roots. What we're talking about are more recon. Therefore, from Sarah... God multiplied and spread across the lands of the Mediterranean and Europe, and in each of a royal prince made of his descendants. The question that needs to be revealed is, who were Judah and Sarah? Biblically, they are the descendants of Jacob, out of Israel. Remember, Jacob is Israel. But to the ancient world before Christ, they were much more. The discovery by the ancient Phoenician historian, St. Cuniaton, who lived around 1200 BC tried to make sense of this issue. It must be recognized that all material from Sanctuniaton is derived from the works of Philo of Biblos, flourish 100 AD. Are we just talking about Ariel's Piso, the Pisos? Remember my Piso series? He might be Philo, who claimed to have translated his Phoenicia from the original text. Some have questioned the authenticity of that claim, but excavations at Ras Shamra ancient Ugarit in Syria in 1929 revealed Phoenician documents supported much of St. information on Phoenician mythology and religious beliefs. The writings of St. Cuniaton mentioned the Greek Kronos from the Phoenicians called Israel. Huh? Hold up. So he's saying St. Cuniaton, right? Famous Greek historian saying Kronos is the same one the Phoenicians call Israel. Who's Israel? Remember, Israel is Jacob. Israel was the new name given to the biblical patriarch Jacob. The Phoenicians historian further explained that this Kronos or Israel had a special son named Jehut or Jehud. So even Kronos had a son named Jehud. 
just like Jacob has his son named Jehuda, Jehuda. This is simply a shortened form of the Hebrew Jehuda or Judah, the primary son of the Greek Kronos, Roman Saturn, was Zeus, Roman Jupiter. Therefore, Jehud would be the same as Zeus. So they're saying Judah is Zeus. So you see what they're trying to tell you here is that the Greeks turned all these people into their gods. That's what I was saying earlier. So again, don't get confused. Kronos, Jacob, his son Zeus, principal is Judah, Zeus, or Jehud, Zeus. Therefore, Jehud would be the same as Zeus. The word Zeus may actually derive from Jehud as the Roman Jupiter, as it appears to derive from the Greek Zeus Pated or Sut Pated. Sut meaning a king to a common bloodline, Hebrew and Pated meaning father. In the Aeneid by Virgil, the word Jupiter is synonymous with Zeus. Therefore, one can surmise that the following names are synonymous with both Hebrew and Phoenician names as Isaac, Uranus, Jacob, Chronos, Saturn, Judah, Jupiter, or Zeus, and Sarah could be Zeus too, right? A son of Zeus or descendant of Zeus or descendant of Judah, a son of Judah. This is the Phoenician explanation of name terminology, but it is muddled in ancient beliefs and pagan ideas. Thus, it must be looked at from another standpoint that merits logical terminology of the period. The period in which Judah lived was a time of famine and attacks by the Egyptian pharaoh, who in victories recorded on the wall at Karnak expected tribute and sons of leaders given as hostages for his reward. Judah, known to the Phoenicians as Jupiter and also known as Zeus, the Olympian in Greece, left for the Mediterranean region. Judah is given the name of Zeus, the Olympian, probably due to his great feats there as well as being the father of the Hebrew royal bloodline after Jacob. He is portrayed by the Titans, Taitan, in the same manner as others he has descended from. Isaac, Uranus, married Gaia, G, earth goddess. Son, Jacob, Kronos, god of heavens, married Rhea, the gazer. These names given to the biblical ones were used to signify a priest of the sun, heavens, or the traits one portrayed used over time since Adam and Eve. The Titans were considered adversaries to the Egyptians. Judah, or Jupiter, Zeus, married two Pleiades, Maya, eldest, or again, Maya, and Taiget, who were the daughters of Atlas, Ephor, Kitim, Hatan, all right, grandson of Abraham, told by Josephus and Pleione, Amazon. His son, Sarah, Zeus, married Electra, Roma, a Pleiade, and also a daughter of Atlas. Judah, the lion, and the builder of nations, could for this reason surmise as long, being Zeus, the Olympian, and father of many, as Jacob foretold in his blessing. The reasoning for Sarah as being Zeus is the understanding that Sarah is the father of Dardanus, as well as many others that inhabited the Mediterranean region of ancient times and you guys get it that's why they say Dardanus is the son of Zeus because he is Zeus is Sarah or Judah or of the line of Judah it's the same this is what they're letting you know they turn them into mythology and into their gods who are the Greeks a lot of these so-called Greeks are Israelites they're Judah and Danites check out my Danite videos Zeus in the Iliad by Homer is said to be by Linus, the father of Dardanus. This would make the Phoenician name of Zeus synonymous with the biblical name of Sarah. Both Judah and Sarah would be well known in the ancient region of Greece and Egypt since they lived there under the pharaohs and were the fathers of many children as tabulated. The name Zeus or Sud Pater, Pater meaning father, would be synonymous with a high ranking, almost worshipped type man. He was looked upon for guidance and security over all the mortal, and in some believes in mortal offspring. A final important point is that if one explores the language of the word Seut, means a kin or bloodline to a common peoples, in this case the Israelites, and pater meaning highest order or father. Therefore, Zeus is the father of the bloodline, as witnessed in ancient times by the Egyptians, 
and the tribes that made up the Mediterranean area. One can explore these facts or pagan beliefs to many deaths, but the main reality is the genealogical bloodline has been recorded over time asserting to the migration of the tribes from Jacob to the Mediterranean area during this time period. This is how they recorded it through mythology. Stara Marion Electra, Roma, who is a daughter of Titan Atlas Ephyr, he team finds the final point in this resolution. Stara being the father of many and king to Titans would make him the most likely person to be Zeus. A great deal of Babylonian paganism was overlaid onto these historical characters. They added their Babylonian paganism creating the false gods of the Greek and Roman mythology. Okay, that's a big one right there if you really think about it. A number of royal genealogies based on Homer described the descent of Trojan royalty as follows. Zeus, Dardanus, Erictonius, Tros, Ilus, Laomedon, Priam. While this lineage might appear mythical, we should note that some ancient myths about the gods were actually rooted in stories about real people. In fact, many pagan religions began in part as ancestral hero worship. Thus, from the line of Farah came the royal house of David, while from the Sarah line came the royal house of Troy. All right, so we're going to belly flop a little bit to uh, chapter 2. I was still in the book Judah's Scepter, A Historical and Religious Perspective by Brian Arundel of Wardour, Howard, and it says here about Troy, we're going to uh, go to this part right here. It says here, the Trojans were a great alliance of people whose kings descended by birthright of the scarlet thread from Sarah, Zeus, holder of the royal scepter. The foundation that the Trojan people are known for it is the great citadel they built in the same place over centuries time named Troy, Ilium. Down here it says the founding of the city known as Troy Ilium started with Dardanus, the son of Sarah. According to the ancient Greek story, the Iliad by Homer, Dardanus' grandson, Tros, was the namesake of the ancient Trojans. So that's where the Tro or Tros is coming from and of their capital city of Troy. Tros had three sons, Ilus, Ganymede, and Asaracus. The reigning kings of the Trojans were of the line of Ilus. Aenis, founder of the Roman Empire, was a prince of the royal house of Asaracus. Okay, do you guys hear that? Who of the Roman Empire was what? A prince of who? Asaracus, who comes from Dardanus, who's a son of Sarah, who's a son of Judah. So who's the so-called Greeks and Romans? There's a big one right there. I know Edomites has a lot to do with it, but a lot of it is some Israelites, you know, becoming so-called Hellenized, right? Christianized, Hellenized. So the famous Aeneas, founder of the Roman Empire. All right, so we'll probably be coming back to this book in another video or in this series. We're going to go to a different book now. Hope you guys enjoyed that and understood what they were saying. And you guys can see many people talking about this. And I'm going to read from this book uh, right here now. It's called Our Race, Its Origin and Its Destiny a serial devoted to the study of the Saxon riddle, the renewal of history, how empire was rebuilt and replanted, Eokaid, the Heremon. And this is by Charles A. L. Totten. This is from uh, 1892. We're in part one, it says here, the renewal of history, the kings of Israel and Judah. We present the following table to our race as one of the most important chronological discoveries of the day in that for the first time in history, it not only vindicates the true or biblical line of time, but affords us at last a means of synchronizing all the reigns of the kings of Israel and Judah and of harmonizing all of the confusing cross-references thereto found in Chronicles and Kings and in the Prophets. Prior to the publication of the present volume, the subject now to be treated has never been understood, nor has any scheme been devised whereupon all the biblical references concerned have received at first glance a satisfactory solution, unencumbered by alterations and apologies. We introduce this table here for several reasons. 
primarily because history cannot be correctly written unless it is built upon the absolutely correct chronological sequence of the years. This is a fundamental sign qua non, and in that the 507 years of duration between the coronation of Saul and the dethroning of Zedekiah, both inclusive, have been misunderstood all along the line. It stands to reason that the true history of this monarchical period has yet to be begun. Secondly, we introduce the table in order to fortify our own position as to the chronology and to beget thereby the good faith of those who will verify the references. For we are deeply concerned that those to whom these pages may find their way will through this chapter of chronology and the others presented in these studies become as convinced as we ourselves that the Bible is the most accurate volume upon earth and per consequence that its remaining and unfulfilled predictions are certainly worthy of implicit faith. But we have another important purpose to accomplish by locating this particular chronological chapter at the commencement of the present study. In the first series, we have followed the several threads of Hebrew fortune down to Zedekiah's fall. From that time and at that time, if ever, the course of true empire took its westward way, anticipating the mock empire of the Gentiles, which soon followed in its wake, and still strives to overtake it. It is now in order to recapitulate the absolute succession of rulers in strict genealogical as well as chronological order, so that we may arrive definitely at the dividing line between the old and new regime. It was in the generation of T, Tefi, and Eokite the Heremon. Eokite the Heremon and Tefi, Queen Tefi, she's of line of Judah. After what happened with Zedekiah and his sons being murdered. And Eokite the Heremon appears to be the person she married to continue the lineage and the scepter, the royal line. So it was in their generation that the transition from the east to the west took place, which constitutes the renewal of history. By means of the present chapter, we shall be able to follow the generation consecutively from Saul down to T. Tefi herself and thus so far as accepted history goes down to the disappearance of the scepter from the house of Fares. So this uh, chapter kind of breaks down the whole genealogy from Saul, actually, and they go down. And so we want to get to a part where it starts getting into, um, you know, the part where Tefi, right, and Heramon. And this part says, Moses now grows up as a prince in the house of Pharaoh. He is given the best education that Egypt could afford and had for his companions in the schools Heman and Chalco and Darda, the sons of Mahol, or Asaria, who was the son of Ethan, the son of Sarah, the son of Judah. Now, Chalco and Darda were none other than Cecrops and Dardanos, okay? This is another book telling you that Darda is the same as Dardanos, and Chalco is Cecrops in Greece, in ancient Greece, Cecrops. Again, both sons of Judah, the founders of Greece and Troy, okay? Sons of Judah, founders of Greece and Troy. Cecrops founded Athens, right? We're going to get more into that in another video. And He-Man is the founder of Tyr, all right? He-Man founded Tyr. Who's the Tyrians, so-called Phoenicians? Why is Herod the Great dealing with Solomon and King David? Because eventually they are king. They are related some way further back. And they also got Danite. The Tyrians got a lot of Danite blood. We've gone over that in my Danite videos. So He-Man, again, all these people, sons of Judah, studied these nations. And to link the sequence to more modern times and show how Judah's scepter passed in prospect to the West, even before the breach had fallen upon Pharez, let it be pointed out that Chalcol or Secrops, who was Neil to the Egyptians, all right, that's who he was to the Egyptians. Neil is Chalcol, son of Judah. They called him Neil in Egypt. Was the father of Gadhold, who married Scotia, the daughter of Menepta. Scotia. Who's Scotia? Remember, didn't they name Scotland after Princess Scotia of Egypt? Gadhold married her. Who's Gadhold, the son of Chalco? So he's Judah too, direct line. Judah, male line, daughter of 
Menepta, that's who she is, daughter of Menepta. Now Menepta was Darem, the son of Ramses the second, who was Rijan, the son of Seti the first, who was Walid, the son of Ramses the first, who was Tardan, and Tardan was the son of Duke Amalek, the son of Eliphaz, the son of Isau, Isau, the son of Isaac and Rebekah. What does that mean? He's the son of Isaac, uh, sons of Sac, right? Saxon, another Saxon, through Isau, not through Jacob. Do you see where that all the way back? These are so-called Egyptians, but it ended up with Isau. You see that? That's deep right there. Hope you guys are paying attention to this and you can verify this lineage. You can pause it, take a screenshot and go verify. This is deep right here. So this Gadhol, who was a descendant of Judah, a son of Chalcol, who was known as Cecrops in Greece, and Neil in Egypt, got with Scotia, who's an Egyptian, whose ancestor is Esau, the son of Isaac, Saxon, <laughs> son of Isaac, and Rebekah. Remember, Esau is the twin of Jacob. They're brothers, twins, same parents. But Gadhol begat Isru, and Isru begat Shru, and Shru begat Heber, Scott, who was the brother of Cadmus, the brother of Cadmus. Remember, Cadmus came out of Egypt. Now you see the, all the relation. And you know, Cadmus, also another pioneer founder of an ancient Greek nation. Now Heber Scott begat Boahain, and he Agaimhain who was the contemporary of Jesse, and Agai and Haim begat Taid, and he Agenoin, and he Lam Fion, and of him Heber was the son. Now the son of Heber was Fion, or Adnoin, in whose days Dido fell, and Fion begat Fiblar, Glass, and he Nian Nual, and by lineal descent from Nian Nual, the next five generations are Noag Gad, Aloid, Irchada, which is Fergus, De, Father, and Brother. Brother was the contemporary of Ahaz, and he left Getulia or Carthage and four transports and came to Spain, and having named his harbors of refuge, Portugal, after his ancestor, Gatelus, he started to build Brigantia. His son was Breogan who finished the shield in the days of Hezekiah. Now Breogan begat Bile, and Bile was the father of Galam, who is Milesios, okay? Galam is Milesios. Do you see where Milesios is coming from? The progenitor of the Milesians. So it came from the sons of Chalcol. So it's telling us that Milesios, right, is the same as William the Conqueror of Ireland. And his son were Heber and Amherdin, the Druid, and Heremon, who married T. Tefi. That's his son, Equit Heremon. That's where they're coming from. All right, a line of Judah through Sarah. And then T. Tefi, she continued the line of Pharez or the line of David, the female, because all the males had been murdered by Nebuchadnezzar. Again, Titefi, the daughter of Sedekiah, who was murdered by Nebuchadnezzar, and whom God saved the line of David, and wove it back into the scarlet thread of Sarah through Sarah. Thence, in direct current, flowed the blood of Judah, Sarah, Perez, and David, down into the victorious vein, and whom from all the other streams that went out of, from Egypt in the days of the 19th dynasty, it is additionally reunited to Judah. And had we time to sketch it, so it reunites to other European streams that through the male line proper trace back their descent to David himself. The line that was saved by a woman. All right. The line was saved by a woman. You guys understand? The line of Judah through David was saved by a woman. Brought with it to Ireland. Remember who brought her and who was with her? Jeremiah, right? the house of God, which is Bethel, and the ark with its treasures hid unto this day in Taro's mount and the harp of David that 
tuned anew within those famous halls, and with it, in its heraldry, there came the Lion of the tribe of Judah, which is still an ensign to the tribes. My God, what do the rich men with their means when the possibility of treasures such as these lie close at hand? But enough in the 18th dynasty, Egypt was a kindly cradle. But when Edom in the 19th got the temporary dominion, all right, Edom in Egypt, right, the process of shaking the yoke from off his own neck drove forth the nations to their destinies, all right? So don't forget, all these people, even though they're coming out of Chalco, his son married this Egyptian whose ancestor was Isaú. So there's still Isaú bloodline in there too, in a way. But they're going through the mills, right? All right, so we continue a little further in the book. It says here, the renewal of history, or Eo Kaid, the Heremon. Remember, he comes from Shakol, the son of Shakol marrying Scotia, an Egyptian princess who has Esau as an ancestor, but Ikawit is coming down from the line of Judah. Part three, it says here, Farez and Sarah, their genealogies harmonized. We have already traced the separated lines of Pharez and Sarah down to the generation which marked their junction in the marriage of Echoite, the Heremon of Ireland, with T. Tefi, the daughter of Sedekiah. With the former begins the Milesian line of Irish kings, and with the latter we have hitherto been taught to consider that the line of David ended. The readers of these studies mere outlines of the new and true history of our race know enough to the contrary to be willing to pursue the investigation to its legitimate end and consequences. Before we resume the story, however, it will be well to glance at the genealogies of these two lines of Judah and show that they agree and that the junction was both a natural and a possible one. It is our purpose in some future study to consider the subject of genealogy in a consecutive survey from Adam down to Victoria Dove, the 153rd generation since creation. At present, we are only concerned with 27 generations from Judah to T. Tefi. These, so far as the line of Perez is concerned, are found in the Bible and amount to three times the judgment number. Or if we count Judah himself as one, then all the generations in the line of Perez are 14 to Abijah and 14 more to T. Tefi. 28 in all. The generations of the rival line of Sarah, schismatic from the first, are two sets of 13 or 26 in all to Heremon, the son of Galam or William the Conqueror of Ireland. Thus from Sarah to Lamphion, inclusive are 13 generations, and from his son Heber to Heremon, who married T. Tefi, are 13 generations. We obtain these generations from sundry chronicles of Ireland, and they are not only independent authorities, but are so explicit in their subordinate enumerations, which span disjointed eras, that there can be no mistake in our list. It is also to be noted that they are, of course, innocent of our present work of harmonizing them with biblical data. The result which we now offer should squash the objection that Heremon could not have been the contemporary of T. Tefi. He was the 26th, and she was the 27th generation from Judah. And there is margin enough had the mere numerical discrepancy been even greater. This is manifest from a comparison of the ancestry of Moses and Joshua, who were certainly contemporaries, although Moses was but the third from Levi, while Joshua was the ninth from his brother Joseph. In the long run, therefore, say 27 odd generations in two such important lines, we may fairly recognize the naturalness of this parallelism. All right, so before I continue, I want to show you this table they have here in the previous page. Okay, so again, they have Abraham and Isaac, right, and Ishmael, right? His two sons, Ishmael, you get the Muslims or Arabs. Isaac, right, the sons of Isaac or Saxons, the sons of Isaac or Sak. You get Jacob and Esau. So as you guys can see, Jacob and Judah, Judah, of course, had... Fares and Sarah, and then they got their line here uh, pointed out for you. As you guys can see, that they would match. 
they would be able to marry Tephi and Heramon, Heber, Eokite, as he is called too. And a little bit of Esau's line, you got Eliphaz, Amalek, Tardan, Walid, Rayan, and Darem, Moses, Exodus, or Seti the first, or Ramses the first, or Minepta, right? That's why he was called in Egypt, but they had different names too. Thus, Esau was descendant in Egypt, ruling Egypt. So as it says here, the genealogies of the T. Tephi, Jeremiah's ward, and Enochide, the Heramon, all right? Jeremiah's ward. So how many people knew about this? Look at all these books we're reading, guys, today. This is history. This is true genealogy. It's not about mythology or just Bible stories. This is real people. It's a real history in the Old Testament. We should expect, moreover, the line of Sarah to be shorter than that of Pharez, since the latter had two children when he entered Egypt, while as yet Sarah had none. It is also to be noted that many of the generations and reigns in the line of Pharez were very short. The table here submitted explains itself and will be found advantageous in a reparisal of study number four. We have introduced the line of Isaú in a parallel column because Walid, the fifth son from Isaac, through Isaú was Setai the first. Okay, that's who Setai the first is. That's a big one right there. You see that? And that Seti the first of the 19th dynasty. The one that knew not Joseph. This king married Tua, the granddaughter of Amenophis the third, whose wife was Saya, the daughter of a notable king and queen of Mesopotamia, believed to have been Mohul or Phoenicia, Farsa, Phoenicia, then famous in those regions, whither he had repaired from Egypt to prosecute his studies and language. The son of this marriage, Sedai the first, and of his wife Tua, was Rijain or Ramesses the second, Rijain, okay? The redoubtable pharaoh of oppression. This Rijain had a daughter, Scotia, whom God hold. Remember Scotia? They named Scotland after the princess of an Egyptian king. She's a Egyptian princess. She got with God hold. Who's God hold? The Milesian, so-called by anachronism, married the son of Rijain, was Darem who was the famous Minepta of the Exodus, Minepta. The genealogy of Darda, the founder of the Trojan line, is given to Aenes, who carried his traditions to Rome. Okay, Aenes, he was a line of Judah. The sons of Shru are important. Cadmus, again, Cadmus, we already got him, being known on account of his itineraries in many lands, and Ciara, being the father of Partalon, one of the primitive settlers in Ireland. Okay, so you see how these people all connect. This information is found in some histories, Vide o Halloran, but it's printed in small type because it is doubtful. It being at least possible that Partalon was a pure Danan. All right, that's what I was saying. I've been saying that to you guys. These people, a lot of them have Danite blood in them too. They are pure Danan, a lot of them, not just Judah. Kaiser, the Druid, so far as generations are concerned, is seen to have been a contemporary of Asa. The three generations preceding these two personages were stormy ones. It was in them that Israel sought its tents and left David's house to take care of itself. While in the Milesian line, the sons of Sarah left Scythia for the West. All right, Scythians, Saxons, Scythians. It will be noted, however, that in this table there has been no attempt to meet the chronological parallelism. It having been sacrificed for the more valuable purpose and present connection of harmonizing the generations numerically. Finally, it will be remarked that the numerous Hebrew names found in the Mileso Irish genealogy have a significant bearing upon the derivation down to Gadhol. Every name is biblical. Ezru and Shru are equally so and are similar to Esau and Esram. In Boahim, we see a relative to Boaz and Rehoboam. Hebrew Scott is of similar Hebrew derivation and obvious meaning, there being three Hebrews in the Milesian line 
relatively quite as many repetitions of this favorite ancestral name as we find in the Bible itself. Bile and Galam complete with the list with Hebraic significance to the philologist. Indeed, we doubt not that the whole of them are quite as susceptible of Hebrew derivation as Partholom, Bartholomew, and Irkada. With these preliminaries set forth in Part 1, 2, and 3, we are now ready to resume and conclude the story of Titefi, as involved in that of Eokad, the Heremon. And that's the end of Part 3.